banana slam jam. So this is going to be a unique replay analysis. Somebody donated for me to watch Miracle's Perspective in a Jug game. So we'll talk about anything I think he does right pretty much. I think when you watch, I guess what I'll do for this approach is to do a replay analysis of how I watch pro games where apparently he's playing some jug mid. So my initial thoughts when I watch, I'm going to basically narrate this in a way that I would in my head be thinking about what I'm wa when I'm watching a pro game. Like these are the things I'm going to think about when I watch a pro game. So uh, when I'm watching, when I'm looking at their lineup, other than Slardar, they don't really kill Jug very well. Um, but what happens is it's really hard for Jug to do damage in fights. So Razor is a pretty survivable hero. Usually goes uh, first item Yules, so Omni Slash kind of loses value. Pugna can decrep any of his teammates. So kind of like the Pugna Jug matchup is a matchup where both heroes don't kill each other. So um, it's a situation where whatever team is able to threaten one or the other, meaning like if Jug's teammates can threaten the Pugna or vice versa, that generally goes in that hero's favor. In competitive, I think Pugna is really good against Jug. In pubs, I think Jug is good against Pugna, um, simply because Pugna requires better team coordination to make good against Jug than the other way around. So when I look at these lineups, I think to myself on Jug, it's a pretty standard game of I need to avoid Razor and Slardar on the map, and I need to look to take skirmishes rather than head five on fives for a very long time. I hear that he's going to go a unique build here, um, and we'll check out that as we go throughout the game. Uh, but uh, in terms of his starting items, he goes for a wand. He is mid. He's probably against Pugna. Uh, if he's against Razor, that'd be a little bit weird, but it's almost certainly a Razor safe lane. And Pugna does spam a lot, so maybe Wand is just better than something like, you know, a couple slippers of agility for damage. Uh, against Pugna specifically, who has like 48 base damage, I guess you don't need items that give you higher base damage. If you're against an intelligence hero with like 60 or 70 base damage, then that's... don't I don't think it's viable to go this Wand first item, but since Pugna has very low base starting damage... Um, he can get away with something like a wand and sacrifice damage. Looks like he might have like first picked random because I think he has more. Yeah, he has a mango and a fairy fire for free. So like the mango fairy fire wouldn't be in his build if he hadn't randomed. No counter for him against this. He's actually going to level Healing Ward level 1. So Spin doesn't really do anything, doesn't help him get CS. He doesn't need it for survivability. So he actually uses Healing Ward as like a free salve and then levels Crit in order to kill the Jungle Camp. So that's an interesting, very unique situation where you don't have a Spin by level 3. And that's cool because recognizing what Spin does for you and whether or not you need it is recognizing, hey, this is a very specific exception. The way I look at rules and exceptions in Dota is I'm doing the rule unless I have a very specific reason to do an exception. It really bothers me when people differ from the norm in skill builds or item builds, and they don't actually have a specific reason in mind. They're just like, I just wanted to try it. It's like, if you think it's good for this specific reason, then try it, sure. But if you're just doing it to try it, that's just bad. It's like strictly worse than what's usually good. If you have a really clear-cut idea in mind, that's when you can differ from the norm. Um, so I like that he's kind of just avoiding the lane. Um, when you first pick like this, you're generally going to have three bad lane matchups, which he does. It's probably why he went mid, because they picked Slardar. And uh, he's just accepting that he's not going to beat Pugna in lane. Every time he walks up, he's just going to get decrept. So he's just making use of that jungle camp as much as possible. Doesn't need boots in a lane like this. He doesn't threaten the Pugna. The Pugna doesn't threaten him. You just need to maximize farm efficiency. Notice how in a lane that's bad, he pushes out the lane as quickly as possible and then leaves. Something I've been flaming in other coaching sessions or replay analysis. When a lane's really good for you, you can push and then be efficient and farm. When the lane's really bad for you, you can push the lane just to be efficient to get out of there as soon as possible. So that's what he's doing. I'd be a little skeptical of him going bottle. I think that that's overkill on Jug. I think he went for like boots and clarities here. I'd rather that... 
Oh, we actually went Wraith Band. Okay. That's fine. I honestly think anything that speeds up his farm speed is good. So I thought Boots at this stage just because it helps you walk from camp to camp faster. He may end up buying Bottle just for the sustain. But I personally, as Jug, haven't really played mid, I guess, but... So obviously going back for a normal skill build in the sense that he has the max spin, but he instead, because he has no threat on Pugna and he has no I no uh, aspirations of rotating, has actually skipped Omni Slash at level 6. So all I can say is if you see stuff that is unfamiliar to you, meaning like it's not the standard, just come up with a reason in your head why a pro player would do it. And you can learn yourself about how you can come up with these unique situations. Because at the end of the day... As long as he wouldn't have used Omni Slash, especially because he's at low mana this entire time, because he's been using mana to farm. Notice how now he was holding the skill point until his spin was off cooldown again. He could have maybe leveled his Omni Slash if something happened. But he still just doesn't have it, because you, you can't Omni Slash Pugna. He's not trying to outplay him. He's in a bad lane matchup. He's just chill. To con he's just content to trade back and forth. All he needs... Like, that extra point in Healing Ward makes a huge difference here. 50% extra heal... From the healing ward going from 2 to 3%. I've learned where you have no aggression on the opponent. Just get your items, like aggression potential. Just get your items, farm up. Buy as much that can give you efficiency as possible. Have enough sustain that you're not dying. And then uh, itemize to eventually do something. Most matchups where you can't do something to the guy early, you can eventually outscale them. Um, if it's not the case, you probably just picked a really bad matchup. Um, in this case, notice how he was able to bully the Pugna away. And now that he has level 8, he has leveled the Omni Slash, potentially looking to rotate since he has boots now. He did go for the bottle for the extra bit of sustain. I think that's fine. If you need the sustain from the bottle to make sure you stay on the map, you do it. Look how much efficiency with the mid lane he is. Like, I had a replay the other day where the person just never hit jungle creeps from the mid lane. Look how many times he's hit jungle creeps. You can do it when you're way ahead, you can do it when you're, you know, at the disadvantage. In this lane, Jug's the type of hero, I told you in this game, that's really hard to kill solo from any of the heroes on the opponent team. But if he walks into them as five, they're very strong. So it's really important that any time the opponent separates, that he tries to draw attention to himself, and then he backs off. That's what he's going to be trying to do this entire time. So notice how his choice to punish the Pugna leaving the mid lane is not to counter gank the Pugna because of all the things we've talked about between Pugna and Jug. Instead, he's trying to force people on the opponent team to come to the mid lane. I would almost certainly believe that he's probably going to leave the second he forces a reaction. I mean, in this case, since it's just a support, he could consider doing something crazy, but there's just no reason to. Pugna's about to respawn in 10 seconds, and it's just a risk that it, like he's just trying to force reactions. The way, if you're a hero that doesn't do well against the opponent grouped up, but is very survivable when they're not, all you have to do is create pressure in lanes such that they can't group up. That's the whole idea. And potentially show up to skirmishes when you see three people top and the opponent, like this guy's clearly solo, right? He knows he's solo based on the information he had on the map. These are the type of engagements you take. Right back to midi goes, that's where he belongs in terms of like every game you have a home and you have to have a specific reason why you leave home. In that case, we talked about why he went bottom. And then once that reason is no longer the case, you go back to home. Creating pressure on mid lane constantly. Notice how fast his rotations are. Just efficiency between jungle camp to jungle camp, or lane to jungle camp. Even got the faded brooch. Pretty good item on Jug, I'd have to imagine. I haven't played Jug this patch. I played him once, I think. I didn't get the faded brooch. Look, he just constantly forces reactions and then backs off. Rinse and repeat. And even though he's 2-0-0, meaning like he's had hardly any kill participation, I think you can see, after what I'm talking about, how big of an impact he's having on the movements of the opponent team. Notice how the Snapfire keeps having to come back to mid, Pugna keeps having to come back to mid, and this is what I mean by he is not AFK farming. Even though he is farming, this is not AFK farming, because he is actually creating a lot of pressure on the map. His impact on the game is still in existence, even though he is not fighting. So I hate when people will call a farmer AFK 
when they are doing what he's doing here. Because he's actually creating a lot of pressure, having a lot of impact in this game, despite having very little kill participation. Notice the rinse and repeat. Force reaction, back off. Force reaction, back off. They leave, go back to mid. They leave, go back to mid. Cat and mouse, tug of war. Not tug of war, whatever. Cat and mouse. Rinse and repeat. This is what I'm talking about when you can't fight people. And why it really bothers me when I have a teammate that can't fight them, that never tries to pre pressure towers, because the way you force them not to fight you is by forcing them to react to you. Otherwise, they just walk down lanes. The biggest deterrent to a team grouping up and pushing towers is to make them react to the defending one. Um, so, sadly there, his spin was on cooldown for like two seconds. And he could have omni slashed, I think? They planted a sentry. He could have omni slashed here. I think he just thought he wasn't going to die that quick. I think that was a bit of a misplay. I think he could have omni-slashed and he would have lived, but... Bit of a misplay there. Um, he is going for a unique build with the Radiance into Manta. The thing is, he already has a Troll, um, and he has a Venge. So Venge represents a lot of physical damage, and Troll is all physical damage. Disruptor's not really damage, either way. Like, yeah, his spells are magic, but he doesn't really do that much damage. And Puck is a limited amount of damage, and they have a Razor. Um, and they have tree to sustain and they have pugnus to sustain so if he itemizes for physical damage the opponent can just buy kite items and armor and It's really easy for the opponent to outscale them because they have no mixed damage So in this specific game, I think it's really cool to take a physical damage hero and Turn them into a magical damage hero. I tried building jug like this one time and I had like a mid lane Say like a Pucker and Invoker or something. And we just lost because the opponent took no magic damage because they just itemized against all of our magic damage. And I realized how bad it was because I made it so not only did one of our cores do only magical damage, but two of our cores only did magical damage. But in this specific game, since he has a Troll Warlord, who if he were to build physical damage, him and the Troll Warlord would be countered by the same items, the same playstyle. Which is not good. It means that any item the Pugna buys defensively or Razor buys defensively counters two heroes at once. Now they need to build a pipe if they want to counter his item. Even though I wouldn't have built a pipe if I were Dire prior to the Jug building a Radiance. Meaning like, I don't think Puck's enough to buy a pipe. Like, I wouldn't buy a pipe just because the opponent has a Puck. Um, and Disruptor's also, like I said, not that much damage. And since he's also against Pugna with Decrep... Uh, his, his, kit, his kit is innately countered. So, uh, it's a nice little adjustment. Uh, the person who donated this replay says that he goes Radiance against Razor. That kind of makes sense, but I think it's more so for the Pugna this game. That'd be my judgment. Because Radiance is still a pretty decent right-click item. It's 60 damage, so it's like his ultimate will still do a decent amount of damage. And, uh... Now he'll also do magic damage when heroes get decrypt and stuff. So in terms of talents, he took the movement speed. In a game where you're playing elusive on Jug, I really prefer the movement speed. On games where you're afraid of getting bursted down and you're more skirmishy, I prefer the stats. So it makes a lot of sense based on how I talked about this game, that he went for the movement speed. He also took the Blade Fury movement speed talent. I was going to say, I'm almost certain he'll take the Blade Fury talents with this build. He's actually almost hasted. Does so much damage for that. I'm curious if he takes the level 20 Blade Fury talent. They have a lot of physical, but it also sounds really nice, so. But just notice how, like, he's linked and is supposed to do no damage, but he's actually doing a lot of burn damage. And he gets decrypt. Uh, and he ends up getting the kill, lingering damage from Radiance. The Radiance already paying off. If he had had normal physical damage items, both of those heroes would not have died. In this game, he pretty much has to spin in the middle of fights because he just dies to all the AoE stuns, magic damage, etc. So if he's spinning, and you, unless you have a Maelstrom and you're proccing it, which Maelstrom got nerfed a lot, um, you're just not doing any damage. Battle Fury doesn't cleave, right clicks don't do any damage. So with this build, he's actually able to do damage while pushing spin, and so he's itemizing and playing accordingly. And the best way to deal with a lineup that kills you as 5, but is weak against you as 1, is to just out-farm them. Simply out-farm them. Get a massive net worth lead. Um, obviously, the safest part of the map is the top lane. Bottom lane being the dead lane. So most of the time, he will be top. The one time he went bottom that we saw, the opponent had shown, I believe, four heroes mid. So whenever you're going to go bottom on a hero like Jug, most carries in general, 
Um, I would say the definition of a bad dead lane farming hero is a hero that has to plant their body on top of the wave to farm it. Like, they literally have to walk up to the wave and right-click it. Because the heroes that are better are ones with long-range nukes, as well as heroes with innate mobility to get away. Um, they're just harder to gank, right? But a hero that puts themselves right on top of the wave that's vulnerable, those are the weak dead lane farmers. Um, the only time he went to the dead lane was with an exception, right? There was a reason why he was allowed to go there. Um, otherwise, he will never be there. He also had Aegis and uh, was farming up the rest of his Radiance when he went to the dead lane. So very specific reasons to go there. Otherwise, he's going to play the efficient, safe part of the map, which is top. Manta obviously just goes really well on Jug in general, but with Radiant specifically, very good. Also against Tree, also against Slardar Amp. Just a very good item this game in general. So I think he looked at their heroes and said, I need to go Manta, right? He's against Trees, against Slardar. So why not also buy a core item such as Radiance that synergizes with the Manta? Generally, when I pick a hero and I look at their draft, I'll think what items I really need. Meaning, like, do I need Manta? Do I need BKB? Etc. And then I can think about what else ties into that equation. Um, sometimes there's a couple options, so you kind of determine what happens throughout the course of the game. Um, and sometimes there's just one clear-cut build. Uh... That just makes more sense. So notice how he's still playing the top half of the map. Actually using Blade Fury for movement speed. Kind of fascinating. Very similar to the game I just played in the sense that like you get like a farming efficiency item. Uh, you're like kind of vulnerable to dying if they like four man gank you. But you're really hard to kill if they don't. And you just out farm them. That's all you do. Play the top half of the map. Out farm them. Push in the lane when they leave. Back off when they come. Notice he hasn't contested them directly a single time this entire game. What I mean by directly is they walk at him as four and he fights them. That is what I mean by directly. Has not done that a single time this entire game. He sees a fight go on. He decides to hit more creeps. Push in top lane. Create pressure on their dead lane. Even using Manta Illusions to cut mid. Probably going to TP soon. Uh, no, never mind. He saw three heroes, so he knows he's good. Yep, he has all the information in the world to keep staying here. Stay here until they force you out. Then you leave. If you don't have a good place to go, which in this case what I mean is he leaves because he doesn't know where they are. But if you don't have a good place to go, meaning they haven't given you any information on where a safe place to be is, you simply walk back. You can sometimes hide in the trees if you're scared. You can walk directly back in the lane. The worst thing you can do when you know you're supposed to leave because you don't see anybody is to like TP to your own safe lane. Because what if you TP here and then they just show four heroes mid? Suddenly your entire map is closed off and it's like, oh, shit. So in this case, he didn't see anybody, but he knew he wasn't safe to stay in lane. So he just creates the pressure and then backs off without TPing. When you're doing these types of games, one bad TP, one bad map movement can really just throw the game absolutely ruin the game because you lose all map control um and map control is crucial in these types of games because if you have map control where you're pressuring lanes that's the that's a very crucial aspect to being able to avoid fights um he removed the tree which means that uh you know it's naturally going to be favorite like juggernaut in this game is much more favored when there's less heroes in the game meaning like he'd prefer a 4v4 than a 5v5 so notice how he kills the Pugna real quick. He did take the Blade Fury DPS, so does a shit ton of damage when he's on top of you. Notice how a hero that never kills Pugna is killing Pugna. So that's how showing that the build is like specifically catered to this game. Going for the E-Blade. I mean, he's not even a physical damage hero at this point, so why not? He can also save teammates with it, so it's a multi-dimensional item. He's almost certain they are rushing, so he now TP, he pressures top and then TP's out and starts being efficient on the bottom half of the map. Notice how he has a specific reason to go to the bottom half of the map, because he knows the opponent is at the top half. He even chooses to keep a faded brooch over Titan Sliver. That says so much about his playstyle right now, meaning he purely cares about avoiding them on the map and uh, running around really fast. One of Jug's main limitations to farm speed as well as mobility is simply just walking around, so. Notice how hard he is to kill. He doesn't really do all that much, but notice how hard he is to kill. 
And this is a game where, because that's the definition of the game, that means he doesn't want to fight them head on. But in this case, if they overextend, they're your tier 4s, you kind of, or tier 3s, you kind of just have to fight them. A uh, little bit of a wasted army slash, I'd say, but it could be worse. And now, you pick them off. Notice how close this game is, despite the fact that he's 9, 1, and 3. A lot of your pubs will end up like this. And I'll tell you right now, if you're Miracle and you're in a pub like this, where you're 8, 1, and 3, and... You know, or like 6, 1, and 3, 5 minutes ago, and you have one bad TP from up here to here, you just lose. You actually just fucking lose. And people, I really get tired of people in my um, chat, or just people in, Do in Dota, generally complaining about, hey, I'm 9, 1, and 3, my, I can't win games. If you're this farmed, you can't mess up. Like, you just can't. You have the power to win the game single-handedly. That's just how Dota is. And if you throw away that power, you're just going to lose. And it takes one massive mistake in a game where he's this farmed to lose. So the build's already paid a lot of dividends, clearly. He hasn't surrendered map control a single time this entire game. I think that's really crucial to notice. Almost level 25, 30 minutes in. 330 CS while 9, 1, and 3. Pretty much the definition of how to solo carry uh, a pub game. That's why he needed a Manta this game. So he can spin and then Manta off the tree ult. It's all about separating the opponents, out efficiency them such that you can separate them. Um, I mean, Shiva's is the most natural item. This is basically an alchemist build, right? Um, applied to Juggernaut. Meaning, like, all the items go together. It's just a different hero. And we've talked about all the reasons why he didn't go a standard Jug build this game. Yep, notice how he went bottom for a specific reason. Now he's back to top, where his home is. They do gank him really well. Oh man, the survivability there. He, I'm actually going to rewind that to see exactly how he survived. I mean, his item build, it makes him very survivable, but what exactly does he do in terms of chain order of spell usage and ability usage? They just smoked. They put a sentry ward down that we could see. He bladed himself, then he spun. I think that was actually a little bit messed up, because you can't do both. But he used Healing Ward just to distract. Puck saved him, and then he's out. It just shows how hard it is to kill him, but the Puck did sac- Most likely have to sacrifice? If the Puck gets out, that's pretty nutty. Yeah. That was just a smoke gank from the opponent, where sometimes you're going to die like that. And, some games in a, and sometimes in a game like this, he might just lose if he died there. Funny, there's been games where I keep Faded Brooch for a really long time. But he's queuing up the Bloodstone. I have a hard time believing he gets Bloodstone, but I guess it is the best quote-unquote damage item. Maybe Octarine's more damage? I'm not actually sure. I mean, the opponent's eventually going to separate, and they're eventually going to try to push out the waves in order to counter you, and that's when you pick them off. Especially when you have another hero like Puck on your team that can in a mo in a use mobility to push waves. You also have Disruptor to catch people, so it's a very split push heavy type game. Obviously, Team Liquid team, meaning like X Team Liquid, Team Nigma now is a very split push heavy type team. This is the way they like to play. Miracle, really one of the most defining players of this playstyle in the entire world. Yep, Tree just feeding again. These kills on supports are like game changing, by the way. If you didn't realize that. Like, if you're a support and you're dying at 35 minutes, you're actually, like, ruining the game. So he TP's bottom because he saw three mid. Notice how he had a specific reason to know why bottom was safe. His team overextended without him there. Which is a little questionable on his team's part, but that's life. He's just so farmed. He actually just killed a Pugna, like, full to zero. I'm almost surprised he held his Omni Slash there. I would have potentially Omni Slash defensively. I mean, it did no damage, obviously, because he was linked, but... 
He's gonna re-engage now that the Link's going out. Look how much damage his build's doing, knowing that he's against a Pugna Decrep as well as a Razor. Notice these Ghost Scepters. They have to build them, because they're against Troll. They have to build these Ghost Scepters. But because of, like I said, he has a Troll core. You can't just go Radiance Jug when you have, like, a Gyro Safelink. Because then the opponent just buys pipes. And uh, you ta they take no damage. But because they were forced to itemize against the physical damage of Venge Troll, they don't have any way of dealing with his items. So it's really cool, that aspect. And you may say, BSJ, what if they just go pipes anyways? Well, it's like, then they aren't dealing with Troll's item, or Troll as a hero nearly as well. And your Omni Slash still does a lot of damage. He is actually able to E-Blade his teammate there, or at least he was going to. So that's, like I said, a dual functionality of the E-Blade. And now he's just accrued 11k lead by getting 3 or 4 crucial kills now that he's 5-slotted. And he did go for the Octarine. I thought that was, like, the natural item that he would go for. And, yep, easy win. So I'll wrap it up there. Um, I will just say, if you're in these types of games, and you make one map surrendering TP, you have one stupid death, you're gonna lose. Look how long this game was nearly even. And the only reason why he was able to play the game he was able to play was because he was forcing the opponent from grouping up from five, as five by creating pressure on the map. And the minute that that pressure on the map is lost, the opponent's gonna walk down a lane, you're gonna be a jug that can't fight them, and you're gonna lose the game. So that's the kind of situation where that's how you win when the opponent has a really strong five man, but really weak ability to kill you. And a really good textbook play by, by Miracle there. You can kind of just ignore the build and apply the concept of what he was doing in a grand scheme of Dota. And that's something that, even though you saw the build and you could try it on Jug if you have like a physical damage core on your team, I think more so taking away how he played the game against the opponent's lineup, given the like parameters of what their heroes do to him and what he does to them, etc., based on what I talked about at the start of the game. So.